G'day everyone, welcome back to Medieval Mayhem. My name's Ben. Today's video is an absolute cracker. Check this out. Oh, I'm so happy. Right, yeah, so I've been planning on doing a bellows project for like a long time. And recently I had the chance to get this done. So let's just put this down for a second. Right, so the objective of, of this project was pretty simple and straightforward. I really wanted to come up with a set of bellows that would be useful for uh, a medieval style camping environment. So anyone who's into LARPing, that is live action role play, the SCA, the Society of Creative Anachronism, uh, even some sort of cosplay events, that kind of thing. And this is all really good, uh, medieval reenactment especially. All right, let's take a quick look at the history of these. So in terms of history, there's actually really not a lot to go on in terms of uh, medieval history for these. There's only a few images of these being used in some of the codexes and uh, illuminations. So there's not a whole lot to go on in terms of um, what they looked like, how big they were, that kind of thing. So you really have to use kind of um, your assessment of the knowledge that you can get and then apply that sort of backwards. Uh, so reverse engineer something. There's a few images we find from fairly early on and that's kind of like interestingly a, a more of an accordion style of bellows. Um, I find that really interesting uh, and then you get to more of the traditional kind of understood shape such as this. This is what most people know and understand as being a set of bellows. So this is what we decided to go with. So I needed to use an aesthetic which was going to be understandable for everybody and so when you get visitors at a medieval reenactment event they like to they're only going to stay with you for a few minutes, sometimes 10 at most, often not even that. And so as frustrating as that can be, you have to work with, with and make your presentation very understandable and very relatable. And so they're not really kind of trying to understand it too much. It's just a very easy to understand process for them. And so I wanted to make sure I stuck with something that was going to be fairly easy to understand. So the tools that I use, um, as in a lot of these projects, I use modern power tools. The reason for that is most people who follow this video are going to be using modern power tools themselves. And that's fine. I'm not doing this to recreate um, an item fully. I don't even think that that's always very possible or manageable. Um, and certainly from a cost and time perspective, it's not. I try to have an end result which is something that would be understood to be a medieval product. And that's why I tend to use power tools. I'm also disabled, as you might know, um, physically as a, a number of disabilities, as well as which I'm a single parent to three kids. Uh, and that's a very busy lifestyle. And so therefore my time is limited and I only have a few hours each day where I can throw myself into projects. I've all got a lot of other stuff I've got to do as well, as we all do. And so, um, Keeping it simple and using modern tools is what I do. Supplies. Okay, um, when we're talking about supplies, I use stuff that I can readily access from hardware stores. In Australia, we have really one hardware chain, which is Bunnings, and I'm limited to what I can get from them. So I typically use Tasmanian oak, um, which is a dressed all round timber, uh, as opposed to sawn. You can get some sawn woods, but it's not going to be wood that was available in medieval Europe. Um, so I try to stick with as, as best I can with a result which would be closely resembling the history because I am a medieval reenactor. So that's what I tend to use. Uh, obviously, um, dressed all round wood wasn't necessarily very available in the medieval period, but oak was. Uh, I also use pine from time to time. But most of the time I'm using oak these days. Uh, it's, it's a very robust timber. It lasts extremely well. And hopefully some of these projects will be used by my grandkids or my great grandkids. Who knows? All right, let's talk PPE. This is really important and I've totally undervalued this off in the past. Um, so PPE, personal protective equipment. It's so important to protect your eyes. Uh, eye pro hearing protection uh, and a mask where appropriate. I tend to also to use just clothes um, that I just use in my workshop um, because I don't like getting my, my nice clothes 
all wrapped up with glues and woods and sawdust and everything else and often I'm very much covered in sawdust and, and so on. So there we go. Uh, also if you've got long hair, which I do, um, have it tied back, uh, minimum jewellery, that kind of stuff because otherwise you're risking too much. Um, and there we go. Alright, so the design of this thing. Um, I went for a very simple straightforward design. I wanted a, a design which was quite easily you know, to understand for everybody, um, something that was quite manageable and also you know, a, just a, a very easy to replicate design. So I've put several pieces of um, uh, 18 centimeter Tasmanian oak together, held them with a um, uh, held them together with a clamp uh, overnight. Uh, I use Sikaflex glue. Uh, I find that works exceptionally well for me. I very rarely see failures on it. Uh, and then I just put the two handles on there. All right, so I left that to dry for 24 hours. And then the next thing I did was just the two handles. Um, these are just nailed in place. Yes, I'm using modern nails. Uh, historically, they would have used um, pegs or dowels. Uh, and that's fine. You just drill a small hole through and, and use that. Uh, as I say, I'm a little bit pressured for time sometimes. And as frustrating as it is, uh, it's also important to get these projects done. Otherwise, I end up with a thousand projects on my porch and not always getting them done. And that's also frustrating. Okay. All right. So the nozzle. Let's talk the nozzle. So the nozzle. That's this piece right here. Let's take a quick look at this. That is about 10 centimeters on either side and it has a washer in the middle. Let's just pivot that round so you can see. So the concept there is half of this goes into the bellows, the other half stays out so that when I'm using the bellows on a fire, I'm not exposing the wood to kind of unnecessary risk and heat because these are quite a time consuming and very fiddly project to do, uh, which we'll talk about as we go through. Um, but there we go. All right. So the way that I created this is I did an extra layer of wood called a nozzle block. All right. And then I cut the part of the second bellows, like the top section off, and that becomes the hinge. We'll explain more of that as we go through. I then drilled a hole into the nozzle block. I coated one of these nozzles in some PVA glue. I use a glue called Sikaflex. It works absolutely fantastically for me. It's an interior and exterior PVA glue. Works fine. Historically, they would have used a cheese glue, which is actually very similar. All right, and then you just insert it. Now, I left mine for 24 hours. Uh, and you'll find with this project, it's just do a little bit, like half an hour to an hour's worth of work every day for about a week, and you'll have a, a bellows. It's nice and easy. The next part is drilling the, um, the air holes. I drilled two. I mean, it's entirely up to you how you do yours. I've seen them with four. I've seen them with one. There's a lot of different options here. Um, the simple concept is you need to allow air into the bellows, and then it try to prevent as much of that as you can from escaping so that it goes out the nozzle. Pretty simple. So I used two, uh, I think there were like 12 millimeter holes and obviously you just want to sand around that so it's nice and clean uh, and not sharp or anything like that. On the other side, on the inside of the bellows, you need to create these valves. Now I just did that with a pair of uh, scrap um, leather and just nailed that down into place whilst the glue dried. Um, I actually find this remarkably effective. There's still a little bit of air escaping, but very, very little. And given that this is primitive technology, I think this is a pretty good way of doing it. So the next stage is the hinge. Right, hinge. Uh, again, just a simple piece of scrap leather, uh, and that works really well for me. I held this down with carpet tacks uh, and upholstery pins. You can buy these off um, online. They just about cost nothing. Um, I think I buy them in packs of 50 and they cost $3, if that, not much. So realistically, what's that, you know, six cents each or something? It's, it's not much at all. 
Um, and as I'm doing a number of these bellows at the moment, um, it works exceptionally well for me. If I buy them resale, um, it's a very expensive proposition. The boot, there's the next piece. This is basically a piece of leather which is designed to go over the nozzle block and holds everything in place. Um, so you just measure it out carefully, uh, understanding what it is you're trying to create. And then again, um, I inserted that over the nozzle, held it down with PVA glue, again, Sikaflex, uh, and the upholstery pins works exceptionally well. Allow 24 hours to dry, perfect. All right, so the next part is the skirt. Um, this was so frustrating. Um, I had to do two attempts on this and it really was a pain in the butt because my brain for some reason managed to mess up the first time. I can get the bottom side of it done really easily uh, and all the, the around the nozzle block but I can't seem to measure accurately around the, um, the top section. So the way that I got around this was to use a piece of paper. Uh, I happen to have some packing packaging just lying around which seemed to be about the right size so I used that and just held it in place while I cut it to size. This worked almost like 90%. There's still a little bit of bunching around the top of the bellows but just about like not very much. You can't really notice it and it doesn't affect how the bellows works. So once I had that cut out I just used, uh, let me see, so in this case I used Gorilla Glue. Um, this was a bit more effective than the Sikaflex um, and not only that but it expands so it holds it perfectly in place and especially around the top section where you get that little sort of bellowing that bunching up um, side of it last part of this um, there's a lot of finishing to do a lot of sanding a lot of just tidying it up making it look pretty um, I really wasn't fussed about varnishing it or like dyeing the leather or anything I don't think I needed to this is um, so my medieval group is a pe peasants group we're primarily a low class kind of a uh, bunch of reenactors um, which is fantastic and fine for us it works really well for us and therefore if it's if it's a peasants kind of item then it's not going to be as fancy as you might get with um, a nobility and upper class so we really weren't that, that, that fussed or concerned about it and there we go. Uh, okay, so testing this, I was amazed about how little air leaked. Um, there's a little bit that comes out of the hinge. I don't think you can get around that. And there's a tiny little bit that comes out of the air holes. And again, I don't think you can exclude that completely. There's a tiny little bit of air leakage on the two valves. That's kind of to be expected. And also around the hinge. I don't think you can really get away with that. I'm not going to worry about dyeing the leather or staining the timber. Uh, I don't think you need to. It's just a utilitarian item. But something like this can really add to your encampment, whether you're in the SCA or in a LARP event or in medieval reenactment. So stoked with this. This is really, really cool. Hasn't cost that much money, but it's such a really great piece to have. All in all, this has probably taken me about a week, but only about an hour, if that, worth of work every day. The skirt was quite fiddly, um, and I can only recommend that when you do yours, you um, use the newspaper or cardboard method and to make sure you get, uh, you, get, you get the correct shape. Other than that, this has come out really well, really happy. This is a really simple project to do. It is fiddly and frustrating and I find I, um, I did get a bit frustrated doing the skirt but that's fine. And then you've got this really amazing piece of kit and it looks so good. One of the big parts of medieval reenactment or the SCA, that kind of thing, is the levels of immersion that you can create. Especially when you've got members of the public around and this is one of those items that people really do kind of visualize and it's it's a big key to making their experience whilst visiting your campsite so much better. 
Uh, I just find it's a really fun project to do. As I say, it's, it's like an hour or so every day for a week. Seven days time, you've got an amazing piece. If you were to buy this off Etsy or something like that, I reckon you'd be paying $250, $300. I do the whole project for easily less than about $80. That's everything can, combined. And it's really not that much. Um, and as I say, the, the level of difference that this makes to a, um, to a campsite, your, your reenactment campsite, is just amazing. And it's, it's a lot of fun to do. It really, really was. For those of you who are into bushcraft, uh, camping and survival, again, this is a really cool product to have. And I think it's a really good part of your kind of, um, you know, your fire lighting kit to have. Fire is so important around medieval reenactment. We use it for so many different things. And therefore, uh, I've done like a bunch of different of these bellows for my reenactment group. Fire is not only used for security, so therefore you have a bunch of fires and other people will look at your campsite from afar and perhaps they might think there are more people there than there actually are. You also use fire and heat in things like blacksmithing, in cooking, in boiling water, in preparation and presentation of dyeing products for cloth and so on. You know, if you have a farrier then the farrier will need to use heat. Uh, and blacksmithing and, and so on. So, you know, fire is used in so many different areas and not just for creating a heat. And it's one of those wonderful kind of parts of the campsite that brings people together. Especially if you're doing group cooking and you have this really cool kind of, um, you know, set up for your kitchen, then having a bellows is, is like, it just adds that next level. And it's a lot of fun. I unfortunately can't show you one of these working at the moment because there's 80 something fires burning where I live at the moment in Queensland, Australia. So there's a massive start to the bushfire season and I'm not going to risk contributing to that. Uh, there are fire restrictions around at the moment and uh, I just don't want to be someone who's breaking the rules and, um, and adding to it. So. In the next couple of months, when the weather starts to cool off, we'll definitely be getting out and definitely do some videos around the campsite that we have. Very keen and very excited to show you guys. So much looking forward to it. Alrighty, everyone. Thank you so much for watching. I've really enjoyed this project. It's a lot of fun to do. Uh, and for those of you who are in medieval reenactment or the SCA, perhaps you're in bushcraft, please leave a comment below. Let me know how you're going with yours. If you choose to make one of these it's just so much fun it's not that expensive when you think about how expensive reenactment can be um, but this is a really fun project to do so i really look forward to catching you in my next video please like subscribe and share and i'll see you then